The third rule here is that there is no tashabbuh without an intention for tashabbuh. You cannot have tashabbuh without wanting to have tashabbuh. In other words, something that's just happening, something that you just do can never be tashabbuh. How? Two points, or actually we say three points. Number one, the word tashabbuh means there is an extra effort because a little bit advanced Arabic here, but just bear with me. Tashabbuh ala wazni tafa'ul. Tafa'ul means you did something to get there. Tashabbuh means to be similar intentionally or unintentionally. Tashabbuh, you want it to be similar. The word used is tashabbuh, not tashabbuh. And tashabuh means to be similar. Our Prophet did not forbid tashabuh. He forbade tashabuh. Tashabuh means you go out of your way and you intend, I want to copy that person. Anything that you do just because you're doing it, because everybody's doing it, that's not tashabuh. Also, we say, innam al amalu bin niyat. Actions are by intentions. And so, if there is no intention for tashabuh, then it is not tashabuh. And of course, there's something some of the classical scholars as well said. Ibn Abidin, a famous Hanafi alim, um, he mentions in his book that tashabuh is only makru when the issue itself is blameworthy and when the intention is to imitate. When the intention is to imitate. When the intention is not to imitate and the issue is generic, what clothes you're, what food you're going to eat, there's no tashabuh in this regard. Therefore, that which occurs naturally amongst any groups of people, this might be tashabuh, but it is not tashabuh. And tashabuh is not haram. Tashabuh is haram. Fourthly, that which is no longer unique to non-Muslims is no longer haram to imitate. Something that might have been unique in the past but is no longer unique now, it is no longer haram to imitate. And this is something, again, this isn't something I'm inventing. Classical ulama mentioned many examples in medieval times. The problem comes, and I say this with utmost respect, many of our ulama still, their mindset is in medieval times. They cut and paste those fatawa and they stick to them without allowing their own intellects to think about the context of those fatawa and broaden. Not all of them, but some or many of them are like this. And this is unfortunately, in my humble opinion, you've listened to my lectures enough to know, this is one of the reasons why unfortunately there is a disconnect between many of the scholars and between the populations of Muslims. A lot of times the scholars, with my utmost respect to them, they are operating in their own little circles of influence amongst their very practicing, very hardcore conservative Muslims and the rest of the ummah is disconnected from them. And there are reasons for this. One of them being, again, anyway, so this is my, my criticism here. When the situation changes and it is no longer unique to the kuffar, then it is no longer prohibited to imitate. And this is why you see me dressed up in this manner over here. Whereas I myself, 200 years ago, would have fully agreed with the fatwas that it is haram to dress up like this. Because dressing up like this 200 years ago would imply something very different. In India, in Ottoman Turkey, in Damascus. Whereas now, times and places have changed. And again, this isn't anything new. For example, there are many athar of the, the Sahaba. Some even say there's a da'if hadith. But there are athar of the Sahaba. There are definitely you know, statements where wearing a certain type of cap, which is called a tayalisa, was considered to be something not good to do. However, this tayalisa cap was worn by the Jews of a certain place. However, and it resembles the type of Frankly, frankly, the shimag that some of the Saudis wear these days, something similar to that, okay? And many other cultures wear, okay? It resembles like that. Um, but uh, the tayalisa was considered to be forbidden or makru by many of the classical ulama, the first two, three generations, because it was something the Yahud did. Slowly but surely, the Muslims kept on wearing, 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 until it became something they themselves did. Ibn Hajar comments on this prohibition, and he says, this would only have been forbidden when the tayalisa was something that was only worn by the Jews. But that is no longer the case now, so it is permissible to wear it. This is Ibn Hajar writing, not some left field progressive guy. And in fact, one of the famous scholars of hadith was called Imam at tayalisi because he was known from a family of this. He was called Imam at tayalisi And the same goes for many other issues. Uh, Imam Ahmed, for example, and some of the early scholars, many of the early scholars, even some Sahaba, they insisted that Muslims wear their turbans with tahnik. And tahnik means you take it over here and you take it under your beard and you throw it behind, okay? So this is the tahnik, it goes underneath it. And they said that it is makru, it shouldn't be done, that you don't practice tahnik. This is the first generation, this was the hijazi style of wearing the turban, let's say. Well, as Islam spread, people wore turbans in different manners. And people would, you know, cut off the tail and wear only the turban. And that version in the time of the first generations was not done by the Arabs, it was done by the Ajam or other people. And there are athar from the early Sahaba and Tabi'un to not dress with the turban. There's not no hadith, there's no hadith like this. Just Sahaba, the and Tabi'un and Imams to have tahnik. Later scholars said, no big deal. If you do tahnik, no tahnik, no big deal. What happened? People just kept on wearing, wearing, wearing until finally it became something that is um, permitted. So therefore, 
It is very, very clear that our scholars understood that something might be tashabbuh in one time or one place or one land, but it is not tashabbuh in another time or another place or another land. And that is, I think, where, unfortunately, a lot of times when you hear these haram fatwas, those scholars are not following this simple rule. Certain things might have been tashabbuh, they're no longer tashabbuh. Now, this is pretty clear, but let's get to the final issue before we get to the actual, uh, the actual going on over here. So, based on all of this, I mentioned four rules. We can summarize the issue of tashabbuh and then move on to celebrations. In reality, tashabbuh applies in two and only two scenarios. That's it. The tashabbuh that is haram, only two things. Number one, when there is something unique to a religion. And the only thing that's unique to religion is the rituals and festivals of a religious nature. Wearing a cross is a religion. Okay? Having the skull cap is a religious thing. That type of skull cap. Okay? The Buddhist um, yellowish thing. Okay? Uh, menorah is a particular religion. So that's, or going to the church or synagogue, this is a religious ritual. The shabbo in that is clearly not something we do. And number two, when a Muslim intentionally goes out of his culture and civilization in order to feel a sense of pride in a non, uh, in a civilization culture other than his own. This is an inferiority complex that is haram because you should take izzah in his own people. Simple as that. If he happens to be of those people, like the Prophet ﷺ was Arab, like we are Americans, there is no tashabbuh when we dress like our own people. We're not going out of our way to dress like somebody else in order. And also, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, even if a Muslim were to be visiting their lands, he's not doing it to get izza, he's doing it to get by through customs without being pulled aside, being dressed in a thobe and a turban or something. No problem there, Islam's not that strict. This is Ibn Taymiyyah writing, the same guy who wrote two volumes on Iftirat al-Mustaqim. But again, his followers don't really read him, they cut and paste from him. They don't read him, as I, I criticize those groups of people that they only read Ibn Taymiyyah, they don't think Ibn Taymiyyah, they just, you know, they don't really understand Ibn Taymiyyah. In any case, so now we get to, after all of this, the conclusions of the actual Eids, okay? So, with that very necessary prelude of tashabbuh, we get to...